desk or in your phone or laptop. Increasingly, companies, it was Apple today, offer services by which they store our data somewhere in cyberspace. It's called cloud computing. It seems to be the solution for an increasingly mobile society. But how secure is it? The BBC's technology correspondent, Rory Kethlin Jones, reports. It's a fact of our busy lives. On the move, from wherever we are, we're putting more of ourselves online. While some have grown increasingly concerned about privacy, going all the way to the courts to protect it, many are happy to share more of their personal information than ever before. Photos, emails, videos, our whole lives. We're uploading our data to places that we can access whenever we want, however we want, and from wherever we want. And we've come to know those places collectively as the cloud. Now, we're used to clouds in the UK and the storms they bring. But have they made us think about how we defend our data? Or is it just too convenient to keep our heads in the cloud? This place has got Wi-Fi. Yeah. An internet cafe in Cambridge, much like many across the UK. It offers free Wi-Fi to all its customers. They give you a password and you're on. Convenient, but is it safe? These researchers from Goldsmiths College in London have come to find out. OK, I'm, I'm going to start capturing information if you want to log in to Facebook. This customer has agreed to take part in a test of public Wi-Fi security. Chris Brower and his team have spent months on this research project. Because they're attempting to intercept other users' data, they ask their permission first. Okay, okay so take a look over here. Tony Short. Yeah, that's me. Result, because both Chris and Tony are using the same network, Chris has been able to hijack Tony's Facebook session. He can now masquerade as Tony until the session is closed. Would you mind if I update your Facebook status? Go on. <laughs> okay. For their research, the Goldsmiths team are using an application called FireSheep. It's designed to intercept data from several sites, including Facebook, Twitter and Hotmail. Jay and James run a small business together. Much of their work is done on one laptop connected to an open Wi-Fi network. Jay Taylor? Yes, correct. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to just hop into your account here. There it is. <laughs> Seems pretty simple. Right? So now you can see that your Hotmail has appeared over here. And I'm going to click and log into your email. Shall I send James an yes, email? Send you're email send? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So you can check your sent mail on this side. And, email and you've just got an email from me, right? Oh, from you, yeah. <laughs> okay. Unbelievable. Okay, so I'm going to go. Another result. Box. Chris has access to Jay's emails and all they contain. His personal data has been compromised with frightening ease. If you show my Twitter identity, I might get some more followers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, what's happening? When you first sign into a site like Facebook, your login details are encrypted. So, even on an unsecured open network, others won't be able to intercept your details. For some sites, like banks, the whole session continues to be encrypted after you log in. But for many, the security ends there. So, once your identity is confirmed, the website sends back a cookie, a data token that says you are who you say you are. But if the site doesn't encrypt that cookie, when it's sent back, it's possible for anyone using the same Wi-Fi network to grab it using a tool like Firesheep. They then have access to the account you've just logged into until you or they close it. So I didn't do this. I have just far sheet Rory's iPad 2. How's that happening? <laughs> Wasn't us. What is the aim of this whole experiment? What are you trying to prove? We're looking at two different things. The one is we're trying to understand whether people's behaviors change once they realize the realities of how easy it is to invade your privacy in these social spaces and in the cloud. And also we're trying to understand responsibility. Is it the network? Is it the services? Is it the user that's responsible for that this is actually so easy and so possible? 
Since it was released last October to much hue and cry online, Fire Sheep has been downloaded around two million times. Its creator, Eric Butler, a Seattle-based developer, unleashed the app to prove a point. The message of Fire Sheep is that sites like Facebook and pretty much anyone who has a site on the web where people log in and have any personal information need to use uh, what's called HTTPS, which is a secure way to browse the web. To check whether a site is using this type of security, just look in your browser for that HTTPS, the S standing for secure, and the padlock symbol. Facebook, like Hotmail and Twitter, has introduced this as an option, but why isn't it simply switched on for everyone? It's something we do want to offer by default in the future, uh, it, but for us it's a process. Um, Facebook is a very complex website where there um, are hundreds of millions of Participants use hundreds of thousands of applications, and so what we need to do is really lift the, um, the the standard across all of the applications, not just our own site. Otherwise, the experience that you have on Facebook is not a, a smooth, consistent experience. Facebook hired a PR firm recently to knock Google's record on privacy. And it's true that incidents like the inadvertent scooping up of data from unencrypted Wi-Fi networks by its Street View cars have generated a few headlines. However, Google's Gmail and other cloud-based services are fully encrypted and have been since the beginning of last year, even before Farsheep's release. So come close. this Google event in Watford, privacy is very much on the agenda. But although its services are protected, is its big tent just a bit too open? So some of the most digitally aware people in Britain have pitched up in this tent to talk about security and privacy and so on. And kindly, Google has provided a nice open wireless network and everybody's taking advantage, tweeting, uh, updating their Facebook statuses, maybe doing a bit of uh, email too. But because it's an open network, somebody could turn up here and use Fire Sheep and perhaps get hold of some very interesting stuff. I'm using your Wi-Fi right now. Should I be being a bit careful? I think you should take into account what kind of information it is that you're talking about, whether you've got HTTPS in place, whether that little lock icon is there on the browser, and you know, judge for yourself what your comfort, what your comfort level is with risk there. Google's top privacy executive in Europe says the company itself, even the boss, relies on its own products to protect its data. If you're using Gmail, you have exactly the same security that Larry Page does on his email. And, you know, he's pretty motivated to make sure that his email is secure. Furthermore, we've got a really strong motivation to make the Internet be a place where people can feel reasonably safe and feel like they can trust it to do interesting stuff on the Internet. Because the more people are willing to use the Internet and use our services, the more we benefit. But the cloud security crisis isn't just about public Wi-Fi. Look at how much Sony had to grovel after telling millions of home users that their data was not safe from hackers who attacked the company's cloud. But like it or not, places like this, the cathedrals of the cloud, are going to store more and more of our precious information. This data center in Slough, run by the American firm Rackspace, may well hold some of your secrets. All sorts of organizations store their data in this particular noisy cloud. So every time I use this card on London's transport system, my journey is logged here. Every time you buy a ticket on the Virgin Trains website, that transaction comes through here. And every time a Kenyan farmer makes a payment using a mobile money transfer system, that comes through here too. Now, I've been through several layers of security to get into this place, but can we ever reasonably expect that our data will be 100% secure when it's stored in the cloud? Information, if you want it online, it needs to be on the web. Can the web be 100% secure? No, but it can be pretty damn secure, same as any physical location. You can put many steps in place to make it secure. You can monitor against intrusion. But the message from the cloud operators is that you, the user, also need to take responsibility for what you hand over and to whom. 
if you look at young people today, they're putting their information on the cloud automatically without really even thinking about it. You know, if I was a, a young person today, I would think twice in terms of what information I want to put, put online which is publicly available. You know, do you really want to put all of your family information, your surname, your date of birth online on a site which people can view day in, day out? I think people do need to think twice about what information they are putting on the cloud which is publicly available. <laughs> yeah, that's really worrying. But back in Cambridge, another user is being shown how insecure they can be on an open Wi-Fi network. The cafe where we filmed has now secured its network with WPA2, which prevents this kind of eavesdropping. So what's the UK's biggest Wi-Fi provider doing? BT already offers users optional software so they can encrypt their own sessions themselves. But when will open network encryption become the norm? Later this year we'll be rolling out this 802.1x technology which uses the same scrambling algorithms that your home hub uses. So it'll be uh, just as secure as that. But it is a complicated high-tech area and I think the old days of small you know, one-off coffee shops providing people with access to their broadband line and giving out the security key is not really going to be the right sort of behaviour for the future. Out on the streets, the Goldsmiths team are spotting just how many public wireless networks are vulnerable to the kind of far sheep attack they've been testing. Starbucks, two open Wi-Fi zone networks there. As well on our right, we've got Pre a manger it's an open Wi-Fi zone. There's an awful lot of Wi-Fi around here. <laughs> there sure is. Down one street, we can find five or six locations that uh, open Wi-Fi networks that you could hop on or off. The likes of BT and Facebook may now be responding to these gaping holes in our online security. But we too need to learn to distinguish our SSLs from our VPNs as we spend more of our lives up in the cloud. Rory Kathleen Jones. Now, in Gaza this afternoon,